So last week we began a new sermon series called Living Sacrifices, and our emphasis is Paul's letter to the Romans, specifically chapter 12. And it's, it's one thing to read a letter to gather information, right? There's certain letters that you get in the mail that you're like, oh man, another bill, right? Or there's other letters that you get, uh, maybe from a friend that you haven't heard from in a while, Uh, Or when you get birthday cards, very rarely do you just read the print that comes from the card. More than likely, you have a note of appreciation or blessing. The card itself is a beautiful gesture, but what makes it great are the words that are written by the loved one or friend. At, at Tyler and Amy's baby shower a couple weeks ago, it was thoughtful. They asked for, for people to, to bring a children's book with a note written in it for baby and family. These are all wonderful sentiments. I remember my grandmother, she used to take her cards and, and date each one of them. Have you ever gone back to a card and read it over again? Or gone back to a letter and read it over again? Paul writes this letter to the Romans not only to instruct but also to inspire awareness and action. The letter Paul wrote to the Romans was meant to be instructional, yes, that's true, and yet at the same time it needed to be practical. It was not as if Paul just wanted to to feed them information so that they could get on the next show of Jeopardy or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Right? It wasn't just to retain information. Paul had this expectation upon the Gentiles through this letter to inspire them to have this living sacrifice mentality lived out in their day-to-day life. And of course, we see throughout church history the establishment of religion and ritual. We see what the early church was back then and what the church is today, and it's gone through a major change, a major change. Fresh off Pentecost, we read in Acts 2, 42 through 47, what the fellowship of believers looked like. It reads this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now take notice uh, in those verses in 42 and 47, take notice of every action that you see. They devoted themselves to the teaching and fellowship and breaking bread in prayer. Many signs and wonders were performed. They were together, together, everything in common. They sold property and possessions to anyone who had need. And this is the one that gets me the most. Every day they continued to meet together. There's an old joke that all of us have said. I've said it multiple times in my life. Pastors only work one day a week. On Sunday, right? But can you imagine this? Forget the pastors. Think about the believers. What about every believer meeting every single day? Gathering together and breaking bread in their homes, it says, with praise and enjoying God's favor. That's a lot of action here, you guys. A lot. And I fear if Luke were to record those same details of the church in America today, it would look very, very, very different. So that's where we're going with this sermon series today. What does living sacrifices look like being lived out? And we could talk until we're blue in the face about expectations or, 
or this, this sense of aspiration, uh, an ambition to, to see this be done away with or, or that be taken care of or starting tomorrow, I'll, I'll focus on God more, right? Or, or today, I'm willing to hand over or surrender these issues and concerns and addictions and temptations. Just these ones over here. In Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, Solomon writes, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to run into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Let me ask you, if someone that you appreciate Somebody that you respect and, and that you love and admire, if they gave you a list of their hates, not just that, but, but what they consider abominations, what would you do with that list? Would you avoid it like the plague? Would you honor their, their wishes? Would you do the best to not get involved or, or to, to actually move the opposite direction to avoid it at all cost? I'd hope so. I mean, especially if it meant that our relationship would be strained, right? Perhaps if we not only entertain these six or seven things, but we acted upon them, it would prove to be detrimental, not only to our relationship with that person, but to our individual lives, to our reputation and our purpose and our well-being. But what about, okay, that's one thing, Lamech, I understand, not acting upon them, but what about enter? Uh, uh, tolerating them. Tolerating them. We don't necessarily call them out, but we also don't turn a blind eye to them either. Where's the line? Is, is there a balance regarding all of this? You see, in Romans 1, Paul establishes that God's wrath goes against humanity because of their sinfulness and wickedness. In our previous sermon series, the last Sunday that we did on Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul gave characteristics of the end of days. And what Paul writes in Romans 1, 29-32 sounds vaguely familiar to what he wrote in, 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 to Timothy. This is what he says, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Here it is, ready? They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also, here it is, approve of those who practice them. Who practice them. Now, the verse in Timothy discussed the characteristics of false teachers within the Christian community. This particular passage, on the other hand, and these vices that Paul talks about, are more generally about humanity as a whole. But, but one phrase that kind of threw me for a loop was when Paul writes, they know God's righteous decree. That would make me wonder if Paul's talking about people inside the faith or is he talking about people outside the faith? But this phrase relates more to the willful rebellion against God that infiltrates humanity, all of humanity. Douglas Moo explains it by saying this, the lack of reference here to the law is significant. Paul speaks of what all people, whether blessed with special revelation or not, can know of God's just judgment. In other words, Paul wrote this with all of humanity in, in mind, not just Christi Christians. Paul was not referencing just a select group of people, or he was not deeming judgment upon a specific nation or ethnicity. He was speaking of all humanity has been given the knowledge of God's righteous decree. 
You see, he's reinforcing what he had just said in Romans 1, 18 through 19. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them. Well, I didn't know. I didn't, God, I didn't know. God makes it plain, people. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I had a girl in youth group one time approach me about a frustrating truth she just couldn't seem to wrap her mind around. She said, Lamech, why is it that God allows a person to walk into church every Sunday, after every Sunday, after every Sunday, and hear the gospel, all the while there are unreached people groups who have never heard the name of Jesus before? She then proceeded to express how unfair that seemed to be. That they hear it multiple times in their life, but on the other hand, this person may never hear it. How do you answer that question? <laughs> well, I pointed her back to Scripture in Romans 9, 1, 19 and 20. You see, God has revealed himself in obvious ways. He's provided what we call general revelation so that people are without excuse. Furthermore, I am, I am a firm believer, this is me, that everyone at some point in their lives will hear the gospel. They will hear the name of Jesus preached. Now, this is where it gets a little muddy whether it's just one time that they hear the gospel preached or 250 times, that should not be our concern. The concern is what they choose to do with the revelation that sh should be the emphasis. How will someone respond to the gospel? What will they make of this triune God that we worship day in and day out? But either way, listen, whether they choose to believe or reject him, everyone will have a choice. So without further ado, please turn with me into your Bibles to Romans 12, 3 through 8. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Romans 12, 3 through 8. We're going to look at the first three verses, 3 through 5. The first po point is humility. Humility. Romans 12, 3 through 5. It says this. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, if you ask me, it would seem to take a special person to even say what Paul has just said, right? I mean, there's two ways that, that people could respond or react to what Paul has just said. First, they could respond out of humility for what's been said. Responding with something along the lines of, you know what, Paul, you are exactly right, brother. This grace you speak of, although God is speaking it through you, this is a desire God has for each and every one of us. That's one reaction. The second reaction would be to say, out of arrogance or, or pride or indifference, who does Paul think this guy is to tell me what to do? Where does this guy come off telling me how I should or shouldn't act? Does, does he know who he's talking to? And, and we're not told, obviously, how the people responded, but there is no doubt in my mind that today this would probably have gotten a strong mixed review. 
But even with this, within this first phrase, after he's established the importance of being a living sacrifice, it comes as a humble honor and privilege to Paul to say these things. He says, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. I mean, do you hear Paul's heart there? He approaches this with, with, with beauty and, and grace. He's gentle and kind in his approach. The word of grace, as you may already know here, is charis, which in the Greek it means charity or gift. And this same grace was offered to Paul, and Paul, through that grace, wants every one of them to know. Yes, well, what is it, pastor? What does Paul want? Have you ever been interrupted before? How many of you have been interrupted today already? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, this whole last week, you might have been interrupted. Yeah. Has a call that you've been on ever been dropped? Yeah. You call back, by the way, from, from like, Dead zone, just to let you know, all of you Girardians probably already know this, but tannery all the way to, what is that, 982, whatever that one is by Fairview. Terrible. Yeah, just, it just drops all the time. Anyways, don't try and make a call there. But you call back whenever you're, you're, you're able to and you try to pick up where you left off and sometimes we forget what we're going to say and, and usually we justify our forgetfulness by saying, well, it must not have been that important. But see here, Paul is being Paul. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He, he never tries to butter up people here. He just goes right to the heart of the matter and he says, here it is, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. You see, Paul, it's interesting because he gives a, a negative reinforcement. It's used as more of a precaution or a warning here. Hey, listen, people, if you truly want to live this whole concept of living sacrifice out, guess what? It begins with humility. That's what he says here. With what Paul has just mentioned about God's grace, it's the same grace of God that is shared amongst every single believer. It's common grace. I would also say that Paul takes it one step further by including not just God's grace, but a person's faith. So understanding that by the grace of God, each of us shares in this faith that is marked by humility. What, what should happen at that point, when we get that and we understand it and we live it out, is that that should help stifle any exaggerated ideas about your status or ministry or my status or ministry. I'd like to add it should not only stifle any feelings of pride or superiority, but also a false sense of humility as well. In other words, listen, having a sense of humility, acting and thinking, as he says in sober judgment here, is not just thinking not to think too highly of yourself, but also too lowly of yourself. As we talked last week, Paul urged them to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transformation, transformational thinking includes humility. He says in Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. In 1 Corinthians 10, 24, it says, no one should seek the, their own good, but the good of others. And in Galatians 5, 24 through 26, Paul gives us a very graphic description of what living sacrifices looks like. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live, live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. In other words, what Paul's saying here 
is if you want to be a living sacrifice for God, lived out daily in your life, interacting with others and putting your faith into practice, it begins with humility. Humility. I'd like to add one more thing before we move on. I began this sermon uh, talking about the, the seven abominations, the things that God hates. Can I direct your attention to the very first thing that Solomon says? Haughty eyes. The, the word haughty is never used anymore. But can I give you a sample of words that fit that same description? Self-important, arrogant, superior, and proud. In fact, haughty eyes, the very first thing that God hates that's detestable to him, is the very, very, very opposite of humility. But here's the interesting truth. Humility is not just about being void of arrogance or living in modesty, but it also is about having an awareness and, a pr and priority of God in our life, so much so that we seek His will in His purpose above our own. There seems to be a clear separation of verse 5 from 3 and 4. And, and although Paul uses verse 5 as a segue into 6, it would seem to stand alone. Yet it makes more sense to place it in 3 and 4 as more of a concluding explanation, right? And as Paul keeps it simple, he wants to reiterate that there is a certain level of commonness. Just as God's grace and our faith is the same for all believers, so too as our body has many, many members and yet different functions, there is a commonality and appreciation that Paul doesn't want us to lose. And furthermore, if we understand and appreciate what we have in common, guess what? And, 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 and yet, what's diverse, then there's no room for comparison. Let me give you a football analogy since we're in the season, right? Is the quarterback more important than the punter? What about the equipment manager or the center? or the trainer, or the general manager, or the offensive coordinator, or the head coach? The answer is no to all of them. Each has an important role and task. Without one of them, the team cannot function at its fullest capacity. See, if you're like me, it's only when we start to compare that we find this, this misconception of what's more necessary or what we can do without. And that here is exactly what Paul's main concern was. That the diversity in gifts would disrupt the unity of the body. How so? How would it disrupt? Because there's always, listen, there's always a temptation to compare and an opportunity for false pride to rear its ugly head when humility is not involved. Second, let's look at verses six through eight to finish. Diversity and unity. Verses six through eight. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So, can there be a healthy dose of diversity that complements unity? Well, Paul seems to think so. He begins by admitting that we all have different gifts. There's, there's no argument, right? We're all on the same page with that. That God is blessed and given many different gifts. There's no argument there. But isn't that a good thing? I mean, everyone in a church having the same gift is like getting socks for Christmas. That's it. Just socks. Don't you dare think about it. And I would take that analogy one step further and say the white crew cut kind of sock that goes halfway up your calf. 
not even fun different colored socks, not dress socks, athletic wear socks, not hospital socks, just plain old white crew socks. You get my point, right? There's a need for diversity and unity. And so the, verse, the, the phrase that we could discuss all day is when Paul says, according to the grace given to each of us in accordance, he says, or in proportion. That's intriguing to me. Playing devil's advocate for a moment, if Paul were trying to diminish any sense of pride in comparison, it would seem that he's counterintuitive here. On the surface, this, this phrase seems to be a hindrance more than a help. A, a, a deeper understanding of this phrase is very beneficial in the moment. Paul continues here with this grace and faith logic. We've all been given different gifts according to God's grace in accordance or in proportion. That word in, pro, in proportion is analogia, which is used as a math, mathematical and logical sense. So when he uses analogia or in pro pro proportion, it has to do more with a mathematical equation. So for instance, I'm terrible at math by the way, but I figured this out pretty quick. If you have a division problem such as 12 divided by 3, if you came up with the answer 9, then you're not using it with the analogia of faith. Your answer is not agreeing with the analogy of faith. It's not correct or appropriate for that matter. You're subtracting, not dividing, right? Or if you answer 36, you're multiplying. If you said 15, you're adding. See, Paul is saying, although there is, is, is diversity within the body, we cannot lose the importance of unity. And see, this is what happens in our pride and self-importance. We, we cannot or should not say, he says, prophesy? Uh, that's not as important as giving. Or the gift of teaching is way more important than mercy. No. No, all gifts that God has given are needed and important to build up the body of Christ, his church. So Paul gives seven specific gifts. By the way, when we started this out, you remember Proverbs 6, 16 through 19? How many things were detest detestable to the Lord? Seven. Coincidence, maybe. But I'd like to think Paul was intentional here. The point of today's sermon is the emphasis of living sacrifices lived out. And so how do we do that? Well, we saw that Paul begins with humility, and then he lists these seven gifts. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Serving, then serve. Teaching, then teach. Encourage, then give encouragement. Giving, then give generously. Lead, to do, uh, do it diligently. To show mercy, do it cheerfully. And really, if you think about it, this phrase, in accordance with your faith, or in a in proportion should be tacked on to each gift. So it should read, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve in accordance with your faith. If it's teaching, then teach in accordance with your faith. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement in accordance with your faith. If it's giving, then give generously in accordance with your faith. If it's to lead, do it diligently in accordance with your faith. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully in accordance with your faith. in accordance with your faith. As God has given each of us grace and gifts to use to build up the body of believers, we should use them without reservation or hesitancy. And so Paul challenges all believers to use what God has given to each one of us to strengthen our witness and willingness for him. Listen, God has given you the ability. But the question is, will you surrender to his will and his purpose for your life? See, it's just as important to be willing as it is to be able. You know, what an awesome experience it would be to see our church, each individual, fulfill this desire of being a living sacrifice lived out. 
that we not only take to heart what Paul has to say, but, but seek wisdom from God and the power of the Holy Spirit to live it out. Listen, my prayer is that this temptation of false pride in comparison will not be welcome here at GAC, ever. My prayer is that by God's grace and our faith in him, we would be able to confidently stand upon the charge that Paul gives in Philippians 2, 1 and 2. He says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Would you praise me?